Hello everybody, this is the first lecture which I'm going to take on animal diversity, form, function, anatomy and evolution. My name is Thomas and I'm working with Sven and Scott in this course. So I will be taking you uh, over the first four weeks of the course and it's going to be an exciting one because it's kind of curious. I actually have a PhD in zoology, which is the science of animals and of animal diversity and of evolution. And I actually haven't taught terribly much zoology because I have become a marine biologist. However, when I actually was given the opportunity to talk to you guys about the wonders of the animal world, I thought this is absolutely fantastic because it actually gives us a chance to focus on stuff which is amazingly uh, enchanting, I should say. Now, just in case you wonder about this strange picture on the left here, I think you should wonder, you should, you should always wonder, you know, never trust anything which academics actually tell you, ever really, I mean, they were, you know, mad people. But if you take this aside, uh, there is a message to the madness here, because what I wanted to illustrate here is that in some sort of weird and wonderful sense, this course is actually a little bit upside down in terms of how we actually approach the topics. Now you can also see those animals are upside down, but normally we would actually have, you know, 10 lectures uh, starting out with genetics and then evolution, and then you slowly move from the primitive animals right up to humans. Now we do it completely different. We actually starting out with us, with memories. So we actually go from the top down and then filter down to uh, bacteria. I think there is even, you know, some mentioned that in the course you might have to do some botany, you know, plants and stuff, you know. I have quite a bit to say about that. Um, I did grow up in a botanic garden. My father is a botanist, so I basically hadn't you know, a very, very good childhood in terms of intellectual stimulus because plants, they just sit there and do actually very little. However, animals are much more exciting and actually go out and do stuff. And basically I became a zoologist because I, you know, everything you need to know about botany, you can actually learn in 20 minutes. No, it's not quite true, but never mind. Now, when I started off zoology, I was reminded of a book we were given by you know, the professor who took us, which was this one, about these strange creatures here. And basically some guy had a sense of humor. I mean, those dark Germans, I'm not German, with a sense of humor. And he essentially wrote a book about fantastic animals and they all stood on their head and their noses you know, were shaped by evolution to fulfill all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, uh, processes in nature. Here's another example. You can actually see this one. He actually, oops, he jumps with the nose, you know, around and the tail actually catches, you know, bumblebees. Here you can actually see another one which actually walks on his nose and he actually catches, you know, fruits in this case. It almost looks like uh, some sort of bean or maize or whatever. Now, all of that is, I think, fantastic because in order to actually do that, you actually need to know quite a bit of zoology. We're not going to be that cruel to you uh, in terms of uh, having you to read a book about fantastic animals. This is what we had to do in the first, literally four months of my degree. And then we basically uh, were told why evolution can actually uh, result in rather interesting structures. So we actually are a little bit less esoteric uh, and we basically start with real animals, with real knowledge, and we're going to highlight stuff for you. Now, today's lecture is about those creatures here. It's us, it's mammals. It's basically the last lineage of evolution. Some would say the most evolved one, but I don't really like that term too much because every branch of animal diversity has evolved in a different direction. 
And it's very arguable whether some traits are truly more evolved in terms of being better in the usage we use normally in everyday life than others. However, as an important message here, we are basically animals. We are just, and we get to that in about 45 minutes, we're not terribly much different from the bright apes. So this lecture is largely about us. It's the group of animals we belong to, the mammals. Now, before we actually go and show you slides with numbers and graphs and that kind of uh, scientific stuff, let me show you four videos I have selected from YouTube. YouTube is actually, of course, sometimes, you know, you can spend hours on it looking up different car tires or gearboxes. I have a Land Rover, so I look up a lot of spare parts, but never mind. Uh, is that it really is wondrous if you select particular elements well to illustrate a concept, to illustrate diversity, but also to inspire awe in you. What I want to do in a, my lectures is really give you a feeling, not so much like how fat textbooks are. What I really want you to take away from those lectures is a sense of enchantment. A sense of enchantment is the natural world. And in the next you know, 90 minutes or so, we're going to talk about two group of animals which are truly, truly, fantastically unique because they do things what no other animal can do. The first one is us, and the second one is birds. So we're going to concentrate on those two groups, and you can actually read up the rest uh, in the readings I have supplied to you. Now let's have a look at the first video here. And of course, you might actually you know, the of the day wanes, balk back and say, ooh, this is all very, very terrible because you know the lions are going to kill some other beautiful creature but that's how nature is so you know if you are a scientist and i think most of you will be scientists you just have to basically you know acknowledge it that. when the night filming crew arrived on the scene of the buffalo kill found earlier the lion pride male had shown up he's the only mature male in the group he's about seven years old and has been fitted with a radio collar by the Zambian carnivore program. He's a big cat, probably over 200 kilos. kilos. And one of his most important roles is to defend the pride and territory against competitors. Hyenas are top of the list when it comes to a lion's enemies. A large clan of hyena have been attracted by the scent of the buffalo kill. All the adult lions, including the females, do their best to keep these would-be thieves at bay. So have a look uh, at at one particular feature, I'm not going to yeah, tell you right now, which is important in that video, which actually characterizes us as well. As a group of animals. The pride male catches one of the hyenas off guard and stamps his authority in brutal fashion. With the breaking dawn, all but one of the hyenas has retreated, but even the injured individual won't give up. Amazing dramas here. There's absolutely no love lost between these two. We'll try and grab them. Right, so what we have here is two essential elements I want to illustrate about the group of vertebrates we are going to talk about. The first one is they're quite hairy. Look at that. There's lots of fur around them. And that is actually important because we are the group of animals which has fur. We have hair, lots of hair. The second element here is social behavior, intense social behavior, and group production. Think about humans, we do pretty much the same thing. Right, here's the next one.
As a matter of fact, anybody who hasn't been up to Harvey Bay to go whale watching, do it. Just do it. I've basically been whale watching in just about every ocean in the world, including on a little rubber duck with sperm whales, but that's a different story. But Harvey Bay is just fantastic. And again, you walk away from there with a fantastic sense of respect for nature. Now what we have here is again intensive and very, very touching almost parental care, but even better is the fact that we had a lion which belongs to the mammals, and some mammals have reinvaded, so to speak, the ocean. You got gigantic animals swimming in the ocean, but they're not fish. They're actually mammals, just like us. They bear life young, they suck it their young, and they have young. Now think about it, that the largest animal on Earth is actually a mammal, but it's a swimming mammal. It's the blue whale, because it could not exist on dry land, because the weight would actually crush you know, its own body. However, if it's suspended in water, no problem at all, because it can actually float. Now you can actually watch, you know, watch the rest of it you know, in your own time. Let's have, a, let's have a look at the next one. And I told you, I, I, I selected the two group of animals which are the most fantastic, I think, amongst the vertebrates, because they do things what no other animal do. And of course, this one illustrates it the best. It's a peregrine falcon. Probably the world's fastest flying. The cliffs are home to the fastest Ooh. animal on earth. Here we go. <laughs> Eyesight is so sharp, she can pick out prey more than a kilometer away. We're actually not so it's sure about that. We, we tried to actually measure Speed that, and it's a uh, it's basically information we get from Falconeers. But scientifically, a kilometer seems like a lot, but possibly. With her wings tucked in, she dives at speeds of 300 kilometers per hour. Now, a skillful bill flip takes care of another. Right, so we chose mammals because we belong to mammals, and I chose birds because there is simply no other organism or group of animals which has such fantastic powers of locomotion. And here's the really curious one. We really think about it, but birds are widely regarded as terrestrial, and they are, but some of them fly underwater. And it's actually called underwater flying. Look at those fellows. Penguins still waddle over the frosty landscape. Wings, they use their forelimbs, which are now modified into paddles. Birds radiate it out. That's an evolutionary term for it. When you have great diversification into all manner of uh, flying uh, uh, species. And yet, some of them went back into the ocean, but they continue on flying. Now, think about this. You know, if you were to be an engineer and you have to construct a diving machine from something which was flying with feathers, you would have a hard time. So, those are the reasons why we thought, okay, let's look at the really, really cool things, which is basically, uh, firstly, the mammals, because we belong to, we belong to the mammals. Now, it turns out to be the case, uh, no other animal group on planet Earth has such a large diversity of body size. 
the smallest mammal is the bumblebee bat on the left here. Four centimeters long, about two inches, and two grams heavy or light. The largest animal on Earth is the blue whale. It is actually 30 meters long and it weighs 30 tons. So astonishing orders of magnitude, but both of them are mammals. And even weirder is the fact that one is flying and one is swimming. Yes, the great majority of mammals occur on dry land, but the diversity of habitats they have conquered is basically endless. They're everywhere. Some of them fly, most of them run around or skid around on land, but many of them are in the ocean as well. Now, you might actually ask yourself, what is a mammal? What defines that group? What defines us? Well, um, if you look at your forearm or you scratch your head or do whatever you like to do to illustrate that, the, most, the, the, the two most defining characteristics are we are hairy. Some of us are more hairy than others and nothing illustrates that better than that uh, hairy, woolly mammoths standing here. And the Latin word mama is, you know, basically uh, in English, breast. So we have mammary glands to suckle our young. It's an astonishing, really, evolutionary achievement, except for a very small group of mammals. You know, we don't really have to, you know, lay eggs and, you know, we can actually care for our young. That's what is, that's one of the reasons we presume is why we are so successful, because our offspring usually have a much higher survival rate. So it's hairy bits and it's having memory glands. The other thing also which uh, mammals have, which is very, very unique, and I'll show you a few more examples later on, but this is just to uh, prep your brain, is we have very specialized teeth. If you look at this fellow here, the teeth in the jaw are not all the same. Now you might say, oh, well, you know, that's a bit of, you know, an obvious thing. Well, not quite really, because most other animals, you look at lizards or uh, many other animals, they will have more or less the same condition, the same shape and size of these going up and down the jaw. The other thing we have is we got a secondary ballot. What does that mean? The roof of our oral cavity of our mouth has basically a sep creates a separation between our nasal passages here and our oral passages. You can see this quite nicely here. Here's the nasal passage of that sheep's coat. And it goes down here, goes down here, goes down here, and then it goes back into the trachea here and the esophagus. What that basically means is the sheep, like this one here, well, not this one anymore, but you know, while it was still alive, can basically chew and eat while it's taking up oxygen through the nose. Now, reptiles, amphibians don't have that. So essentially, they have to stop for actually uh, getting oxygen into their lungs. It's a very, very unique adaptation. We forget about that. Um, so let's have a look at the diversity of animals. What kind of mammals do we have out there? Now here's a early drawing of a platypus from 1799. Uh, and that was actually brought back by the naturalists, by some English naturalists to the British Museum. And when the first platypus arrived as a specimen, people actually thought it's a hoax. They always thought like, oh, somebody made that up. You know, you kind of, you know, put extra skin on the forelimbs here. They thought, oh, they mounted a duck bill on some sort of otter or beaver in Australia. And I tell you what, if you actually have seen platypuses swimming around, uh, uh, it's not so far-fetched an assumption. So if you want to do a very, very rough and quick uh, classification of mammals, there are basically two big groups. The one is what we call a prototerrier, and the one is called the terrier here. Now, what is actually significant is terrier is the Greek word 
for a beast, for wild beast. So the proto-terrier is basically those which came before the true mammals. There's quite a few extinct lineages here, but one group of these really primitive mammals uh, survives. They developed the pellet, they developed good loyal chores, blah, 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 but they already have hair and memory glands. They also have, you know, very long bones and so forth and so forth. But the one thing they didn't lose, because ultimately we all come from birds and reptiles, right? The one thing they didn't actually lose is the laying of eggs. They still produce eggs. So they're called the ornithotelphia, or we colloquially call them the monotremes. Now the monotremes were previously distributed also in Africa and in South America and uh, throughout Asia. But now they are confined basically to five species uh, in Papua New Guinea uh, and Australia, four species of Echidna and uh, the Platypus. The next group is of course, uh, what we in Australia even used to name our sports team. This is one of the rare moments, of course, where the Wallabies, I still support them, uh, you know, managed to defeat the old blacks, you know, look at the sky, wooden to one. Uh, so here we got Wallabies. Wallabies belong to the group of what we call the Metaterrier, which basically means in between the primitive, you know, prototerrier and the true ones over here. Now, what they have achieved is they lost the eggshells, so they bear live young. However, their young are born very prematurely, so to speak, and they're very small, and they basically go into a pouch. Now, the pouch is actually there to protect those very small and uh, born young, uh, from the elements and they actually crawl onto a small little you know teats and actually get uh, sucky there for quite a while. So essentially the gestation period of marsupials is a short one and but we manage particularly in Australia uh, here to have quite a bit of diversity of them. Now and as you can see ultimately the next step is you tell you. never mind about those names up here. Those are the mammals which have developed a very, very unique organ. It's called the placenta. Now the placenta uh, enables true mammals to bear young, which are highly mature. You might actually think as a baby, you know, it's, you know, it's a baby thing. Uh, it's lies there and cries and does other things on the other end. Uh, but it actually is born at a very advanced stage compared to when something comes out of a, uh, uh, out of an egg or for marsupials. And what don't, many people do not realize is that long gestation period enabled mammals to live in environments which are often, you know, fairly, fairly inhospitable. What it also seemed to have enabled is an incredible evolutionary diversification of the Euteria. One could almost say, is there something like a typical mammal? The answer is no. I give you uh, three examples here. At the top here is a pangolin. Now pangolins, of course, have uh, uh, a terrible blight because they're the most trafficked animal uh, in the world, being harvested or poached, I should say, from forests and savannas and then sold to uh, the traditional medicine market in China and other countries, which basically uh, have a high demand for what they call bush meat or traditional Chinese medicine. And of course, in our days, quite a lot of uh, uh, reports that the COVID-19 virus basically came from a pangolin on a fresh meat market uh, and basically jumped the species barrier. And now we have to have the consequences of it. And we got things like, of course, like sheep and gorillas, but they're all mammals. But you look at them and you sort of like, really? They all belong 
to the same class family as well, they do because they all have a placenta, they all have hair, they all have a secondary palate and so forth. Now, let's have a look at all those beasts and Latin or Greek uh, tarion means wild beast. Now, I should actually say, and I have it here, that we will talk about that a little bit later. Oops, here we go. Uh, if you actually want to buy you know a textbook you can actually buy something boring like this right there you know you're a student you have to buy it uh, or you get this thing here it's absolutely fantastic and i have to say uh, you look at the diversity of animals here it is absolutely scientifically correct and uh what is even more astonishing is Oh, look at those claws and claws. I mean, they're so fantastic. There we go. I'm actually, uh, you know, at the moment drafting a children's book. I'm not going to uh, reveal the topic right now. Uh, and it is not a simple matter to get accurate information into a language uh, that is accessible and also. Uh, which is still accurate. So if you want to actually know something about diversity, or if you have, or, or if you have children, now you don't need to have children, I bought it for myself, you know, buy the book of beasts. I, you know, I don't know the, I don't know the person, I picked it up in a bookshop in, in humanity by complete chance. So uh, I don't get actually any economic benefit from it, just in case you want it. Now, this is a horrible looking complicated table here, but you know, read through it, because it illustrates to you, you know, how different uh, orders of mammals have developed very, very unique adaptations. So the first group is the order of proboscidea, and basically those are the elephants. They have elongated the nose into a trunk, and we have all seen uh, the the. The pictures were observed it ourselves. I used to actually live in South Africa for seven years and we did a lot of time up in Botswana and in Zimbabwe. And you will actually be you know acutely aware, but it is a fantastic adaptation to life and it works supremely well because essentially you you know don't have hands to go about your daily business, but you do it all with your trunk. Interesting idea. And it works, of course, because they're the largest land members. I mean, this is a picture where you can actually say only a mother can kind of, you know, love that sort of uh, beauty, but it's, you know, really very, very cute. Now, those are essentially of sorts, you know, elephants which went back into the ocean. I, you know, and essentially the elephant body was a fluke at the back and front flippers. But what is really cool is people say, oh, what is the evidence that this is a mammal? Well, firstly, they have actually very, very small mammary glands. They're still visible, but they still have hair. Those hairs at the front are simply very, very highly developed sensory hairs, which most mammals have. We have them as well, but of course, you know, they're reduced now. Uh, so here we go. Now, even stranger is that kind of group. Uh, and it's the slosses from South America. Also, the anteaters belong to that, uh, and so and other groups. And what they basically do is they have very, very unique claws, which enables them to either dig up ant hills or which uh, they use to actually hang in trees for a very, very long time and don't actually table much. Now. Uh, if you ever, I think, wanted a pet, and I don't know how to actually get one of those, uh, not in Australia, of course, is I, 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 I desperately, I think, want an armadillo. And they have developed uh, a feature where their skin, just like the pangolins, is actually arranged in this fantastic array of horny blades. But they still have hair, and they're still sucking their young, so they're mammals. They almost look like some weird, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, mixture of uh, a reptile and a true member. So armadillo is really, really fantastic. Then we go on and we go to members where the skin develops not only hairs, as on the front here, but spines. Spines are just 
basically glorified hairs. They're just bigger hairs. Now, if you actually think about that one, it's a fantastic you know, way to uh, protect yourself against predators. So those are the hedgehogs, the trumos, the shrews, and relatives, porcupines also belong to that. I mean, isn't that cute? Uh, next up, of course, uh, you know, I have a, also a secret business plan how to make money on the holidays. So, yeah, it will all be revealed if somebody goes to news on the boardwalk during Christmas. But, you know, uh, I picked that up idea, up, you know, once in Santa Fran when somebody jumped out, you know, behind the hedge, you know, um, dressed in a kind of really horrible costume. And he actually scared people, which is actually quite funny. Everybody gave him money. Anyways, my, my daughter's, of course, you know, terribly embarrassed by that. So I still have to sort of, you know, think whether I truly totally do it. But I thought a vampire would be, you know, a good idea. Never mind. I actually went to yeah, uh, Dracula's castle uh, a few years ago, yeah, just to check it out. And you actually think like, oh, it must be this dark building in a gorge, you know, with wolves howling and bats flying around. No, it was this actually very, very pleasant little country house painted white amongst the cherry trees on a beautiful May uh, where the birds uh, day, where the birds were chirping in the sun. So I was a bit disappointed. Never mind. Uh, and of course, Dracula is, you know, associated with bats. Now, the Chiroptera have done something completely different. I said, well, you know what? I know this whole memory business is really cool because we got placenta and we got hair and we uh, are very successful in raising our young. But what I really want to do, I want to be like a bird. I want to actually fly. So what they actually did, they developed fantastically long fingers, grew uh, skin in between them, extended the skin all the way back uh, to their uh, legs, and they can actually fly through the night. As a matter of fact, that can fly so well uh, that uh, you can't often hear them and they, you know, locate, you know, uh, the physical objects and prey in the habitat with echo location. Oh, here's a joke. How do you kill, here we go. How do you kill a vegetarian vampire with a stake in the heart? Here we go. I had, I had to say that. Anyways. Right, on we go. Uh, here is a fox. Now, the fox is, of course, a wily animal. Oh, the fox is actually getting... Uh, here we go. Uh, and that order is, of course, what many animal ecologists, particularly, you know, when you start out as a student, and nothing wrong with that, want to become, you know? People said, oh, you know, those are the dogs, the cats, the bears, the raccoons, the minks, the sea lions, the seas, the walruses, the otters, like... Things with big teeth which eat other animals, often in a very, very spectacular fashion. So the water carnivora, carnivorous means eating meat, is a very, very diverse one, but basically they're all highly evolved uh, predators on two legs. Then we actually go a little bit on. Uh, isn't that a fantastic zebra? Now, the next two groups are often also referred to as the ungulates. Ungulate basically means having, a bit of more after, basically means having uh, a hoofed foot. And there's two different differentiations here. Uh, we either got the, uh, the horses, the rhinos, the zebras, or the tapirs, which have uh, either a single toe, a single hoof, or three. They're basically the uneven-toed ungulates, or we have the same thing, which is basically the even-toed ones, uh, which are the artiodactyla. Things like, you know, the camels, the antelopes, the deers, the sheep, the giraffes, the cattle. Many people often associate, it, associate those uh, kind of ungulates being a typically mammal. Well, and they are, because they got often very... Uh, enlarged memory glands, and if you like cheese or milk or yogurt, there you go. It all comes from those kind of memory glands of the hoofed animals, which are called the artiodactyla. Now, cetaceans, isn't that a fantastic sperm whale? Look at this jaw, I mean, incredible. 
Now, again, we have a group of animals, of mammals. The mammals actually came, of course, from primitive forebears uh, about 200 million years ago. They invaded uh, the land. They came out from the swamps, uh, the monster from the swamp. And uh, a group went back into the sea. And those are the cetaceans now. They still have actually a few hairs uh, around the body, but they don't actually need a fur anymore because they use fat layers uh, to insulate uh, their body. Of course, they are also warm-blooded like other uh, mammals, but the task of keeping them warm is now done by an insulating layer of fat rather than by hair. Right. Ooh, it's not done by, by hair, because the next group are the hairs. Ooh, I never realized that. How is that? Now, hairs are the lagomorpha, and it's basically the rabbits and the beakers and so forth. Now, the unique feature about the lagomorphas are that they chew, you know, copious amounts of grass, and they can also, if you ever try to keep rabbits at home, you know, they actually eat, you know, themselves wooden uh, partitions and the, uh, the boards on their cages because their front teeth uh, bear down by eight, but they actually continually grow back. Now, then we also got a similar idea uh, uh, in the rodentia, and those are, of course, the squeals, the rodents, basically, the chipmunks, the rats, the mice, the beavers the porcupines, the woodchucks, and the lemmings. So everything kind of ratty and mousy belongs to that particular group. And there are uh, the largest or the most species group of all the mammals in terms of the species they have. And last but not least, um, I don't know why this guy actually posts there, but I suppose it should actually illustrate here zoological knowledge very, very quickly. And it did actually happen uh, to me a few times on hikes. That is, of course, not a good idea. Now, a rhino has two features which say they're apart from other audio tactiles. The one, of course, is a long horn, and the other one is a thick skin. But the thick skin is made of the same biochemical element called keratin, like our hair and our nails. Same thing. It's just an enormous growth of hair at the front. And this is the really, really sad thing that, you know, rhinos are at the brink of extinction because people use them again in traditional Chinese medicine. And it is just mixed up hair. You could have, or you could use your own toenails or fingernails. It is totally bizarre. It is biochemically exactly the same substance as, you know, toenail clippings. And yet people pay a lot of money for it. Uh, the human mind is sometimes a very, very strange one. But look at this, you know, a horn made of hair and extremely thick skin. Now, they're not... They're... Right, you get the idea. And here's, here's one more. Now, I selected that one again because it should never be in any doubt that mammals have hair. And unfortunately, those 
creatures here are, you know, uh, their population numbers are dwindling because people like to wear fur coats. And of course, if you are a leopard in the middle of winter in the Himalayas or the Chinese, you know, high plateau at temperatures of minus 30, you need a very good coat. And that's why wearing, not just as a fashion statement, a leopard coat is still considered in many regions of the world a very, very useful collection of hairs. And the prey animal they are getting at are yucks. And of course, yucks are the perfect adaptation for cold climate. And that adaptation, again, is coming about is coming about from having lots of hair. And last but not least, um, here we go. Um, this is a very touching story about pangolins again. Now, uh, I selected that specifically because it is very topical and also because it kind of warms the heart. But more importantly, from a zoological point of view, is the fact that pangolins have this, you know, flexible suit of armor. And that flexible suit of armor is made of scales. And the scales are no different than our fingernails. So again, it is something very, very fantastically unique how hair can transform because it's made from a unique protein called keratin into scales to cover an animal like a suit of armor. I think it's astonishing. You know, in any case, let's have a look at that. A pangolin is a special animal. In the past, in Zimbabwe, we give them to the chiefs as a gift. I was 28 years in my life when I saw first pangolin. I know now the pangolin is the most poached animal, more than rhino, more than elephant. Here in Zimbabwe, we are proud to save the pangolins. Every day with my friends, we protect the animal. We walk them, we feed them, we protect them like our children. We hope the world can see what we are doing in Zimbabwe to save the animal. Right, so all of that is, of course, related to hair. Now, what is actually quite funny, I, you know, when I wrote that lecture yesterday, I thought, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I have to illustrate a claw because claws are made from uh, keratin as well, just like hair. And I thought, what comes up, you actually put in bear claw, and here you go, a grizzly bear paw slipper. I mean, fantastic. I mean, who doesn't want actually a pair of those? Any case, <laughs> it's it's actually quite funny in this age nowadays writing lectures because you try to illustrate stuff, and you know, as you know, when you Google, you never quite know what is going to come up. But here is basically protecting us from mechanical injury, because it provides a code from invasion by microbes, UV radiation, and so forth. It's actually the, you know the, the the function of the skin. It also provides thermal insulation. You know, we, we have to actually wear coats, um, but uh, mammals don't because they've got a coat. They've got a coat of hair. A snow leopard doesn't get coat because the hair insulates uh, the animal perfectly. Uh, the skin also is involved in excretion, we sweat, and in water regulation. And hairs also are very, very important for sensory perception. Uh, in most mammals, except for us, really, uh, there is long hairs around the mouth and they sit in an enlarged follicle. And every time the hair bends, it sends a sensory signal and then you go, okay, right, I touched something, or there's a bit more wind, or there's a bit more movement, or whatever. So essentially, it's a mechanically 
movement receptor, they are highly accurate uh, and very widely distributed in the uh, in mammals. Now, uh, hair is formed as I have you know illustrated you know by the it's, it's a feature basically of the skin of the epidermis and it's you know made from keratin. All hair is made from keratin, and because it's basically an accumulation of dead cells. It gets pushed out, you know, basically from the follicle, and then as it actually grows, of course, mine is actually getting grayer and grayer. It's, you know, a big problem. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, in us, it grows gradual, and we also shed hair. Uh, in others, the the shedding process of hair uh, occurs in bouts, in in periodic bursts of losing hair. And that actually means many animals change their coat from, let's say, a, a browner variety, which is you know providing good camouflage during summer, to you know a white variety in the winter. Uh, of course, we come we humans can't actually do that. And when I used to be in the army in Austria, it was absolutely bloody terrible because he had to actually uh, you know change from you know brown you know, camouflage or green brown camouflage to white camouflage as he actually walked up the mountain and then he actually had to go back. And we had this uh, basically uniforms which were white on the inside or the outside really, but you could basically turn them inside out. And of course you can imagine if you have to actually look after your own clothes, the white is of course very good camouflage, but it's not something you have to give, you know, a thousand uh, and a full battalion of 18 year old boys. Any case, so as I've explained, claws, hooves, nails, uh, rhino horns, they're all basically massive keratin bodies. And the vibrissa, which are the viscous, as we commonly uh, uh, call them, they are very important for mechanical uh, perception. And they also occur, you know, around the eyes. There we go. How do you like my lashes? Uh, or they occur, you know, around you know, the pores as is illustrated here. Here we go, you know, keratin, keratin, and so forth. Now, here's a bit of a, a smelly subject. Uh, you might actually think, what has a perfume bottle with a stag on it got to do with a memory? Well, it happens to be the case, we all smell. Some of us smell better than others, but essentially, our skin, and this is a very unique uh, mammalian feature, has quite a lot of different glands. Uh, we got what we call sebaceous glands. They yeah, produce an oily substance, and which is basically used to lubricate and waterproof our skins, and you know, for other ones which have coats, uh, not a coat that we wear, but uh, a collection of hairs. We also got sweat glands and they're called pseudoferous glands and they basically uh, secrete either a watery substance which is mostly water which just basically keeps us cool but sometimes it actually also has secretions thing that contains salt not a problem uh, but also urea and of course the microbial decomposition of the urea causes us or anybody else or your gym wear or when I come back from a good cycle in summer, you know, you have to actually put that straight, uh, not into the pool room, but into the garage and wash it because basically the decomposition, the bacterial attack of the urea causes uh, smells, which we actually find uh, not terribly appealing. But here's the really cool thing. Many animals have scent glands and we often talk about a musky smell. And there's deer like those musk deers here who have massively enlarged anal glands, which they actually produce a very, very strong smelling uh, substance. And, you know, humans actually have uh, used that to, you know, put into perfumes. And it's sort of it's supposed to be that masculine, you know, kind of bear grills, you know, smell going into the mountains and surviving a snowstorm by crawling inside a dead deer carcass, that kind of stuff. But those glands yeah, are still with us as humans. Don't uh, try and pretend we don't have them. Uh, and essentially they produce pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals which we 
take up uh, with our nose for defense sometimes. You know, we actually smell differently when we are aggressive. Uh, for sex recognition, for territorial behavior, for courtship, all sort of interesting things. And of course, the other uh, massive uh, invention of memories is we have memory glands. Here we go. Now, what is actually quite interesting, uh, because this, this, I actually came up with this joke. So, I mean, what do you call a cow that ceased giving milk? It's an other failure. And of course, this one says, you know, uh, something in the way he mo she moves attracts me like no other lover. But, you know, never mind. Uh, here we go. So memory glands are basically specialized glands to secrete milk following the birth of the young. And in most mammals like us, you know, they basically have many ducts and some of them are enlarged to actually store the milk and they all basically converge on a nipple or a teeth. It was also interesting is that the sucking response in, 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 in the young uh, releases hormones, which in turn then basically signal to the clan, get on with it, produce more milk. And why cows are so valued by humans is that when all those ducts you know, converge just before they come out, they have an enlarged nipple, and there's a really big system where the milk accumulates. Essentially, that's how you actually milk them. There we go. Fun fact. The other thing is, I told you about the secondary pellet. Now, where did I put that? So, you can actually figure that out yourself. If you put your tongue just behind your top front teeth towards the top of your mouth and feel around, you will actually, you know, or you can use your finger, you know, you can actually, you know, feel there's a hard bony plate here. Illustrate it here and illustrate it here. Now, if you actually put your tongue a little bit further back, you can actually sense a tradition, a transition, I should say, between the hard bony roof and a sort of softer part. Oh, there we go. And that softer part is called the soft belly, which is basically just a skinny, fleshy extension, you know, of here we go, here we go. It's here, and there's the hard pellet. And it almost completely separates now the nasal passage from the oral passage. Now, this is a massive, you know, architectural anatomic invention of evolution for mammals because they can now basically speak with their mouth full, which a reptile or a bird could never do. So, quite a cool invention. Right, and another defining characteristic I told you is that we as humans have, uh, well, all mammals have very, very unique teeth. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to teach a course to medicine students. Those are fun lectures. 1,000 people in the same lecture theater. And we had like 400 different skulls of all sort of different animals. And that, you know, in groups of five, you know, students got a few skulls. And based on the teeth formula, which we gave them, they had to actually work out what it is. Because each mammal species has a unique arrangement of teeth. So if, if I give you this skull and I give you this formula, you can pretty much work out that this is a dog. Now, uh, basically, uh, we are heterotont organisms. We have teeth which are not the same around our jaw, and each group of teeth in each species is a unique arrangement adapted to their feeding and uh, lifestyle. The other problem is, uh, well, it's not a problem, well, it's a problem if you go to a dentist and then they take an x ray and then I go, oh, and you just see the dollars you know, rattling in front of your brain. Uh, I jumped off a tune and, you know, I have to have three molars drilled out now because they're cracked as I sort of, you know, came to the bottom. Probably not such a good idea. Never mind. Uh, it was fun at the time. Uh, our teeth are what we call decadent. This basically means they're set inside a socket in the jaw, in the jaw, which is, of course, a marvelous invention because they are much less likely to fall out than, let's say, the teeth in reptiles or in fish. 
However, they're actually very hard to get out if you have them. If, if you have to basically extract the tooth, you know, it's a bit of pliers, that kind of stuff. Now, we usually differentiate or distinguish between four different kinds of teeth in the front here. We have the incisors. Uh, in our case, we have here two incisors, one, two, and this is for each side. So there's four all together. Let's say this is on the right side. Then we have one canine, which is here, which are the conically uh, shaped uh, teeth used for catching, killing, tearing. I hope you don't actually go out there and sort of eat anybody right now because only I have told you you've got a canine. Uh, apparently, it's against the law, I heard, that you, you know, walk around, you know, the pavement and sort of eat people based on biological knowledge. Don't do it. Uh, so the next set is we have two premolars right here. And they're basically, you know, used in chewing and breaking up, you know, uh, you know some food. And then we got the chewing teeth right at the back, and we actually have three of those, the molars. Now, not always do they all break out. And this is basically when you have a wisdom tooth right in the, in the back. This is basically a third molar being stuck inside a jaw. I see you got them all you know, inside. That's why I have probably no wisdom. Well, maybe that's why I have such a lot of wisdom, because you know it's still incorporated into my skull. Never mind. So this is an amazing invention if you think we are the only animal group which developed this variety of shapes of sizes and of arrangements inside the skull to you know reflect different uh prey items and that is also one of the reasons why essentially mammals are so incredibly uh successful now, now for the really cool stuff. We are but an animal. Some of us are more animal-like than others, but basically all of us are mammals. And this is a, a cartoon, of course, which was produced uh, when Charles Darwin first mentioned that essentially humans are just but a continuation of the lineage which uh, incorporates the apes and ultimately us. Now, uh, and you can actually spend your life Googling human evolution and you know whether they're related to apes or not. Um, and sometimes we actually seem to go back. Um, and what is really quite funny, I, I, I flew to Adelaide one and a half weeks ago and the borders opened. <laughs> and I, I landed up literally amongst a group of Mormons. And just by complete chance, I was reading a book about human evolution. So that was a few quite interesting conversations, but let's leave religion out of that for the moment. Now, isn't that fantastic? This is the most complete skull and skeleton ever found, 47% complete. And it's probably the oldest uh, ancestor we have about three million years ago uh it's called lucy the nickname of that particular uh, uh find or fossil and it's uh at the border between kenya and ethiopia uh we went there just you know i don't know as a scientist you actually go to weird places you know because you just hear about that and then you stand in front of the desert a lot of sand and go like huh? Right, here was Lucy found, but still, you know, uh, it's quite touching. If you if you if you basically have taught evolution for for you know a few years, you want to actually see how this you know site really looked like. And I bought my most expensive beer there for a can for forty five dollars, which is interesting, but it takes you about five days to get there in the Land Rover. Any case, uh, here's Lucy, and nobody, I think, who just basically uses common sense who looks at this skull and this skeleton, and this is like three million years old, would deny like, well, you know what? This looks pretty human to me. But let's end. You can also go to Letoli, which is in southern Kenya. And there's a site uh, in, Tanz in Tanzania. And it's a site where, honestly, some sort of early human, or you know, let's call it an early hominid, doesn't really matter. So it's, it's, it's all a fluid arrangement, really. 
uh, walked through the mud uh, and then that mud uh, was preserved in a volcanic eruption, those kind of footprints. Very, very cool. And you can actually work out those animals actually, uh, or those humans, uh, walked hominids, walked on two legs, so they had bipedal motion. Now, why do I put that in? If you, if you like photography, and you know you have a few you know nice cameras and you you get very nerdy and you subscribe to various podcasts and blah 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 now the holy grail of course of really good photography uh, is portrait photography and it's extremely very really hard uh, to get it right unless you of course you're exceptionally good looking like me but that's you know that privilege is not bestowed on too many but the point is, really, it's all about when you do a portrait about the eyes. We are intensely visual animals. And that's why we spend a lot of time, really, you know, when it comes to makeup and stuff like this, enhancing, transforming, and shaping, really, the expression from our eyes. Now, and that is important because we as humans, we have developed a large brain and much of that brain function is actually used to process and transform visual information. But we're not alone having really large eyes. Now, this is, where do I put that? Yeah, here we go. This is the classification of the apes. We basically have, you know, in the suborder, Strepsirene, you know, all the lemurs, the eye eyes, and the bush babies, which hang out in Madagascar, Africa, and Asia. So those are probably very, very uh, primitive primates. Then we go down to what many people would actually call, ah, oh, they're just monkeys, right? They are the tarsid monkeys. Look at this fella. I don't know what he has been smoking. I don't know. Well, maybe I'm really tired of Southeast Asia. We got things like the marmosets and the tamias. You see those, you know, everywhere in zoological gardens. You got the gibbons and the siamangs from Asia. You get the baboons. I got lots of interesting stories to tell about baboons, including one we had to chase through the corridor of the zoology department because he woke up before you know he was supposed to you know perform part you know of you know a display in front of a hundred students. It was interesting. Everybody's scattering, you know, you can't do it nowadays anymore, but it was, you know, reasonable fun. Uh, and, you know, we got monkeys, the, you know, Capuchino monkeys from South America and so forth. And most people are like, yeah, yeah, they're all just monkeys, right? Of different sorts. But they actually belong to a order called the primates, which includes us, because we are sitting here at the top, at the bottom. Now, you compare those six photographs here with those. Now, now it becomes really, really hard, and I leave this judgment entirely up to you. You know, everybody has different views. But if you actually just, you know, try and be a biologist and try not to have yourself influenced by any, you know, religious or any other societal belief, and just sort of compare the images here. It took me a long while. I was like, how do I, how do I really uh, illustrate a human monkey and I, I, you know, or a human which is, you know, basically has the same expression. And it just, you know, happens to be, it was Nigel Farage who led the UK to, well, this quite a disastrous, um, uh, basically political decision in terms of Brexit. But never mind. This is the subfamily of the hominids and or the family of the hominids. So we all are hominids. We belong to a zoological classification, which includes the orangutans, it includes the chimpanzees, it includes the gorillas, and ultimately us. As a matter of fact, chimps and us are in the same tribe. And we are 99% genetically identical. Uh, so this is the current picture, but we can actually look how we actually got here. 
and of course everybody you know has has seen you know uh, basically displays like this or something quite similar what is cool though is this is illustrating what had to happen that we could actually walk on two legs and when we actually when a monkey and I should actually you know illustrate that but when a monkey actually walks on, on, on two legs, they kind of waddle along, right? This is your chimpanzees. We can actually have a smooth stride. And we have a smooth stride because one thing actually happened, and that is our femurs, uh, at, you know, before their knee, they actually bend towards the middle of our vertical plane. That actually makes the center of gravity of the feet in line very much with our narrow hips which are also very important that we don't actually waddle around the other thing which we developed is an amazing ability to balance our head on top of the spine now if you are a gorilla i presume this looks like a gorilla this is actually a problem because you've got a heavy head and it tries to fall down but if you actually have too many chin and tonics you know your head also falls down and that means you need long processes here on your neck vertebra, which are used to attach massive neck muscles to hold your head up. We don't actually have those anymore. We don't need those anymore. Unless you, of course, are in the front row of a scrum uh, in rugby, and you actually do need them. But, you know, uh, we are really not, or well, at least I am really not designed for that. Now, those are the major evolutionary steps we basically started to balance our head on top of the spine because we walked on two legs now there's a lot of speculation really why we as humans are the only ones who can actually walk on two legs oops what happened here and the reason for that is that most likely there came a time when you know the this uh, Somewhere around the split where, you know, apes split off from hominids, where the hominids, the very early hominids, started to spend more time on the ground in the savannah, looking mostly for carrion, for fruits, and for nutty things. There's also a theory now that basically that ground movement, uh, which you could still combine with actually living in the trees for safety, was often concentrated by searching for washed up carrion animal cadavers on the shores of either the ocean or on inland lakes that's actually a very uh, widely promulgated theory now be that as it may walking on two legs and still being able to climb in trees and shelter there is a major advantage and to walk on two legs effectively is the big advantage here so a lot of stuff actually had to happen in our skeletal uh, structure and we also you know all primates have this unique ability to have opposable digits either the sum or something else in your hand that actually means you can hold on to a branch and you can grab stuff you can manipulate things like this pen here you know how important that is because you try and actually teach any other animal. I tried this with my goats, didn't really go anywhere. Actually, my camera is, is mirrored, never mind. Essentially, if you try to, you know, teach any animal to write you a poem, it will actually not work. There is likely going to be a, a, a mental problem, but there is a dexterity problem. We are the only group of animals which have incredible dexterity with our fingers. Uh, if you ever try and, and do a watchmaking course or a jewelry course, you will actually <laughs> very quickly uh, realize how little dexterity you have, but you also realize how much you can learn because anatomically and mentally you have the capacity. Now, you can actually pick up five books or five websites uh, and study uh, uh, or try and, and, and learn something about the exact sequence of 
uh, species which led up uh, to us. The point is everyone will actually show you a slightly different tree and basically there is hundreds of thousands of anthropologists literally figuring out how it actually worked in detail. We know all the big steps and we are also continually learning by discovering new fossils. But basically nobody really argues about the basic Broad's Voss development. And that actually goes from usually very squat, very small organisms, small in terms of, you know, uh, sometimes physically stature, but also in terms of brain volume, to go to something which is us now, where brain volume is about five times bigger. We are often quite tall. We walk on two legs. And we have enormous capacities for tool use and uh, to art and all sort of uh, basically social interaction. So often this is actually a sequence of actually figuring out, you know, how the skull developed in terms of brain volume, how the chores developed, how the teeth developed, whether the animal could actually, you know, or the organism could walk on two legs to which extent and so forth. And, and what they did culturally, because when we do culture stuff, even if we live in a cave, social, uh, basically rituals such as burials, when we make tools, when we make art, and when we paint caves, we leave stuff behind. Archaeology is basically uh, delivering, you know, more and more evidence, fine scale evidence, how it actually all happened that we went from, you know, another group of apes to what is known as called homin. Probably the oldest fossil is this one, which lived about six, you know, seven to six million years ago in the country which is called Chad in the Central African Republic. And it's basically quite small and you can actually see very primitive features, a big ridge of bones above the eyes. And then basically, you know, here is a chimpanzee and here is a modern human and it goes by this intermediate link which I mentioned early on and that is Lucy. Lucy is of course one of the most famous ones uh, uh, discovered in Ethiopia. There's a site in Tanzania and uh, one in Kenya. So essentially the Leakies, the family Leakies were, the, you know, basically really there was a golden decade uh, of anthropology discovering all those amazing Australopithecus uh, ones. Now then this is sort of the tree and it goes from the common ancestors. This is the chap from, from Chad I just told you. And then it goes over here to Lucy. And then probably via, you know, a, a sidestep of Homo habilis, which was basically uh, the first one who possibly had, you know, greater dexterity and almost, you know, 50% bipedal motion. And then we basically, we go to variations. So we just became, you know, basically more gracile, but we also became essentially more brainy. We had bigger brains and we developed, you know, societal uh, rituals and cultural rituals, rituals, tool use, shelter, and so forth. Now there is a very interesting find, which is the most recent one. And this is this little branching off and people basically say, oh, shall we put him down here? But it doesn't really matter. And that is the Hobbit. Now, of course, there's the great theory, you know, that essentially all humans came out of the Rift Valley, which is you know, here. This is basically going here, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia going up here. Chad is about over there. And essentially, uh, we do actually find that the migration seem to have gone up here and down there and up into Europe and anything from, from Asia, they essentially went over Alaska to North America and down to South America. However, there is a fascinating archipelago here. And of course, the you know, true Australians, the indigenous people, I mean, we, we are just basically white interlopers here, um, invasive species, if you like, in the last you know, 200 years, whereas you know, the indigenous people have been you know, here they could give 65,000 years. So we really like just the last second. Never mind. Uh, 
somebody you know discovered you know a group of Australian actually down from Griffith University and their, their Indonesian counterparts discovered this really really interesting group of skeletons in a cave in uh, Java and it was called Homo floriensis and it was only basically a meter tall and so it's called the Hobbit and the debate now ranges this was this some sort of you know early ancestor of humans or did it just split off the splitting off theory assumes a process called island dwarfism now island dwarfism is a phenomenon when species disperse to an island where they either have fewer predators or food sources are not really that abundant that becomes smaller over the generations that actually is documented for quite a few uh, island invaders even elephants on islands like this chunky elephants so this could actually be one of the series here never mind uh, I think the astonishing thing is that finds about 20 years old and not a year goes past I mean I have two friends who work as anthropologists in Ethiopia from the University of Vienna and basically I spent half their year digging around in the in the sand and I actually, I asked him, I said, look, look, don't we actually know the whole story? I said, well, you know, we, we know the story, but we're actually filling in now the details. So we actually know what our uh, ancestry is truly like. So really quite fascinating. Now you might say, if I go back here, you know, you say, oh, we're all just monkeys, really. Well, yeah, in a sense, we are. But what entitles us to a new genus and a new uh, species being Homo sapiensis, the thinking one? Well, the, we still have to actually go about uh, nature and try and find food. But what is that? But what uh, sets us apart is this thing. If you ever have a chance, right, uh, and visit caves which have Stone Age paintings, either in Australia, uh, uh, there's fascinating paintings, you know, up in the Northern Territory, and of course, that assumes no mining company comes along and actually blows it all up, which is unbelievably shocking. Uh, we basically are the only species who has taken on an enormous cultural revolution. Now culture is a very broad concept and everybody defines it slightly different, but it doesn't really matter. We basically have culture in a great different rainbow of expressions. We can make a painting on a cave wall. We actually are such cultured individuals that we have developed a rich tradition of science. And one of the science branches, uh, curiously enough, basically is concerned of how we evolved. Here's Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution. We speak about this in about next lecture and two lectures uh, ago uh, to come. And we do things like this. You know, this is a detail from the Sistine Chapel. Now, no matter how, you know, how closely I bleed with my dog and I give him all sort of tricks, you know, he, he just never actually gets up the ladder and actually, you know, paints my, my garage ceiling or anything like this. So, you know, it's really humans who can do that. And people might say, oh, this is the Renaissance. I mean, yeah, they just basically depicted what they actually thought their religious beliefs were. But no, you know, it doesn't really matter. We have Modiglani or anything you choose, really. We are astonishingly diverse. We can build buildings like this. This is the Guggenheim Museum uh, in Bilbao. If you have a chance, go there. Or the Sydney Opera House. We can do this. This is a unique cultural transcendence and coming together of artistic ability. Now, again, you know, you can say, right, um, um, what makes us truly human? This kind of uh, quite complex thinking that we actually have the leisure now and the desire to create pleasure 
for artists' sake and for our own sake is actually quite unique. Now, animals also have social interactions, but we take it to a completely different level. That doesn't necessarily mean we are superior. It actually just means we are very, very different from, and quite similar still, uh, from other uh, species of the primates. And we can actually, we say, oh, I don't care really about buildings. I don't really care about paintings. You know, I don't really care about ballet. Well, you know, maybe you like, you know, reading literature. This is uh, Oscar Wilde, you know, who actually wrote The Picture of Dorian Gray and many other works. Man, quite an interesting character, really. So you might say, hmm, you know, that's something, you know, which is closer to literature. I mean, I think this is how every, you know, university professor, you know, should really be closed and I should really be sitting. Oh, I could actually sit over there. Uh, maybe on the next one, I could actually be quite good. Never mind. Uh, uh, or... You can be, you know, even more eccentric, and this is Edgar Allan Poe. Now, Edgar Allan Poe wrote possibly the most famous poem concerning birds. And oddly enough, this is going to be the next topic. So, before I go on the memories, uh, people always ask me, what shall I really, you know, Shall I invest in textbooks? Shall I uh, only read the stuff which is on the internet or the lecture notes or whatever? Now, there's you know, various options you can have here. Now, I quite like, you know, if you are serious and you're going to study you know, animal ecology or environmental science in any form, you, know, you want to actually get away with actually buying yourself you know, a book. And you're going to read this over and over again. And it's actually in the, in, in the long term going to save you time because you don't actually have to troll the sources. You don't really be able to trust. Here is two, which are, you know, a recent edition. The details are actually on your lecture slides. Uh, and essentially, it doesn't really matter which one you buy. They're all, you know, fairly good. I just selected those two because they're fairly recent. The other thing I encourage you to do uh, is here is two of my favorite books, and you know, I don't want to sound like a complete nerd that I only read that really, is essentially, <coughs> it gives you a completely different insight into what zoology can be and the group of animals you study. I, I have to say, reading this one is almost like, you know, you can't actually put it down and it gives you a completely new worldview, not a worldview, but a new approach on birds, quite fascinating. And this is, of course, uh, a later edition by uh, an American uh, author, by Anne, uh, and this one by Jennifer, and this is a one by Tim Burkett. Both of them are, are really excellent, really, really worthwhile to put on your Christmas list. You know, I would actually go for both, but never mind. And you know, I told you, the Book of Beasts. And, you know, um, at least you can actually uh, make, of course, I'm not going to put any exam questions out of that. Oh, maybe I should. But the point is, it really, if you have kids or you have to, you know, give somebody, uh, uh, you know somebody with kids and they need a present, you know, uh, buy it and read it yourself a few times before you basically, you know, wrap it again and give it to them. Oh, I didn't really say that. And you kind of also have the big book of birds. And there's also the big book of the sea and the big book of, of insects. Really great fun. And, of course, uh, there is a, uh, a view, and I quite strongly subscribe to that, but this is just my personal opinion. Don't hold me to that. that essentially, a new university course being delivered online should be... Uh, should be equitable and equitable means everybody has access to the resources and then there's quite a few repositories now which you can search which have open source textbooks here is open stacks as one and here is bc campus and i just selected two of them and there's a free biology book and you know this is a short one and this is a full one you know and Essentially, my readings uh, will actually come out of that. That doesn't actually mean that the prescribed textbook for the course uh, is redundant. It's just something you can have for free. There's also books about physics, about stats, 
of how to write assignments and so forth. So here you go. Uh, I will actually repeat that, and there is actually a, I, I put that in a, uh, a word file for you to consume and look up. And I will ask Wayne to actually put that forward. So the next section is about birds. And you might actually want to have a short break as well, but actually let that run. And this is the poem about the raven. If it actually starts, no, it doesn't. Oh, it's a bit disappointing. Oh, here we go. So that's a five minute break or eight minute break. But I leave it going and you can actually, here we go. Okay. 